Hi, I'm Charlton Copeland, a professor of law here at the University of Miami Law School. My primary area of research uh, has historically been federalism. I've uh, written about the, the sort of theoretical underpinnings of the national state relationship. And in those articles, I've tried to, to think about the ways in which conceptions of power uh, are the dominant ways in which we talk about federalism and the dominant ways in which we talk about the national state relationship. But I've tried to think um, alternatively about federalism as a kind of relational conception. That is to say that the states and the, and the national government are in a long-term relationship. And, and I tr I've tried to think about the ways in which thinking about relationality as the underpinning of federalism changes, at least in some ways, the ways we ought to think about the rights and duties uh, that in air uh, with respect to states and the national government. The resignation of the New York State Attorney General uh, has put a spotlight on uh, a couple of issues, right? One, quite obviously, right, gender in the workplace. But the other is the extent to which state attorneys general have been among the most active players in trying to hold the Trump administration accountable. Uh, uh, Attorney General uh, Schneider, before his resignation, was investigating the Trump administration, was, uh, was, was suing the Trump administration for, for changes uh, in various areas of policy. The Attorney General in the state of California has done much of the same. And so we are involved right now in a very interesting sort of federalism dynamic that is sort of um, strange from some of our other sort of federalism conversations. That is to say, um, many progressive th progressives have thought of federalism as a kind of bad word uh, and as an inherently conservative phenomenon. And here we have uh, primarily blue states, that is to say democratic states, states that I think would, would call themselves progressive, uh, suing the national government for what they believe is the failure to uh, to implement effectively environmental policy, housing policy, Medicaid policy, uh, and the like. And so this is a, an area that is, um, is a time, rather, uh, for a really vigorous and, I think, important conversation about these issues. I think that, and I'm biased here, uh, that one of the most important classes students can take is administrative law. It's the area that, that, I, that I teach in. It's, it's one of the areas in which I write. It's an area of uh, real uh, significance, uh, right? The changes to, to Medicaid policy, the changes to education policy, the changes to environmental policy that are taking place in the Trump administration, and indeed that took place in the Obama administration and many other administrations before this administration, uh, have so often either started as regulatory processes or ended as regulatory processes. I say ended often as regulatory processes because often when presidents can't find success through the legislature, they turn to the administrative state. And I think students who are interested in public policy, students who are interested in policy making, should take administrative law. Uh, they should certainly take tax. They should certainly take business associations because among the, 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 the biggest entities being regulated are business entities and corporate entities. And I think we've got to understand the pressures and demands on, on those regulated entities in order to understand the possible effectiveness or ineffectiveness of regulatory policies. One of the pieces I'm working on now is a piece that is uh, connected, in fact, to the, the Living Law Lecture. It is uh, a piece that attempts to think about the ways in which litigators try to shape healthcare policy. Uh, and Florida was the site of a decade-long class action sued against the, uh, the Obama administration and the Bush administration before that um, because of its uh, agreement with the state of Florida uh, over reductions in reimbursements for physicians and, and hospitals under the Medicaid program. Other physicians brought suit against the, the state and effectively the, the, the administration, um, challenging the uh, legality of, of, of those, uh, those reductions, arguing uh, substantively that poor people simply were not going to get effective medical treatment uh, under a reduced reimbursement policy. 
And, and so I am interested in a few things. I'm interested in the doctrinal uh, landscape that made it possible to bring this suit as a class action, to bring the suit as uh, a challenge to Medicaid. Uh, cases like this or, or these issues uh, during this time went up to the Supreme Court at least twice. And, and, and we see uh, suits taking place in, in this area right now, that is to say, um, the, the Trump administration, and again, the Obama administration before that, uh, approved states imposing work requirements, for example, on, uh, on Medicaid recipients. Uh, just this week, the, uh, the head of the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Poli uh, uh, Services denied the state of Kansas's request for a waiver that would have imposed lifetime limits on Medicaid availability. Uh, and, and these sorts of issues are going to be litigated in the courts and they are going to shape, fundamentally shape, the way in which we think about the implementation and future of, of Medicaid. And so that's one of the things I'm, I'm, I'm working on. Another project that I'm, I'm working on is a project around local and county governments suits against uh, opioid manufacturers. Again, this is a, an area of health policy, broadly speaking, and I want to think again about the ways in which the federalism dimension uh, raises its head uh, in these suits and the ways in which litigation becomes the tool for states and local governments to shape substantive policy.